Okay, in this video we're going to cover how to do oil. Uh, Mid-game oil so that you can get into late game. Because oil is one of those tricky topics where it's not so much the power it generates that's so useful, it's more the cooling opportunities it gives you. If, if you just run this uh, oil refinery, it requires a duplicate to operate it. If a duplicate's not at it, it's not running. That's basically how it works. So you need to put in a buffer system for it. But more importantly, even if you had this running 24-7, it can only run two and a half petroleum refineries and one natural gas generator, or about 5.8 kilowatts. That's assuming 100% uptime. You could generate that much power from coal if you really needed to. It'd be expensive and tricky to set up. Well, actually, it'd be easier to set up and probably easier to maintain and require less operation. So we want to use the oil for more than just power because it is quite intensive. So this is a, just a, my current preferred design. It's just a little industrial brick I threw together. This is fairly simplistic. There's a crude oil coming up from the bottom. We've a cord out left and right so that you can, so that I can access all the pockets and have access to lots of it. This oil goes straight up the middle. That's just a gold amalgam pump down there, by the way. And then the oil goes over here and gets buffered in a couple of tanks. We, we, we like to have buffers everywhere. There's, you need a lot of buffers when it comes to oil. Otherwise you get a lot of intermittent operations and wasted duplicates running back and forth. So this buffer tank buffers for this metal refinery. The, right one but buffers for the right refinery you really want buffers here for these things uh, i tried not using them it, it caused intermittent operations uh, in previous patches those chances of explosions so i uh, i'm not i haven't had any explosions in this patch i think they've patched out most of those problems but uh, i i'm taking precautions just in case then uh, after you refine the metal the coolant is spit out and it's nice and hot oil and it gets buffered in these tanks in here so left tank buffers for the left one, right tank buffers for the right one, and then they both feed into the middle tank before being destroyed in the petroleum refinery. Now, that outputs petroleum, which is then buffered into these two tanks down here. The third tank is for plastic, but don't worry about that one. So this will keep running until both these tanks are full. Once both of them are full, it actually shuts this off so that your duplicate's not running back and forth, trying to top it up a little bit. And then the, the buffered oil is then fed into the petroleum refineries, but not before passing around an aqua tuner. It just passes around here, not actually goes through it, it just passes around it and soaks up the heat the aqua tuner is giving off. And then that oil is sent down here and burnt in the petroleum refineries, basically destroying all the heat it just absorbed. Uh, natural gas, same thing, it's siphoned off in here into a buffer tank, sent through around the uh, aqua tuner before being destroyed as well. Now what this does is it powers this little ice brick over here. And that ice brick is basically just dumping cold right into your reactor room. And this allows the cold to spread out. I put in a few metal plates here and there to spread the, the cooling around. But I just want this running nice and cold because this means all the outputs will be nice and cold. Might as well destroy the heat before it has a chance to be created. And then a little bit of that chill is going to leak into the surrounding industrial area and make sure everything remains thermally stable. I'm not trying to chill all these rooms down to zero degrees or anything. I just want to make sure that any heat generated in here is taken care of. The, the whole thing is insulated around the, the sides to make sure that this thing doesn't affect any of the outside world. It's basically a self-contained, thermally regulated base. No wheezeworts required, no space tech, no nothing like that. You put in crude oil and, refi and raw metals, you get out refined metals, power, well, lots of excess power as well, actually. Uh, plastics, glass, whatever you want. You basically just dump them in here. There's plenty of room left for expansion as well. There's other things I'll be putting in later. But this basically gets you to a nice period where you can move confidently into the late game with lots of raw met lots of refined metals and process good process materials that you're going to need for tapping some of the the trickier geysers and vents that are out there now uh the next videos will be of me actually building this and how you construct it all together in a reasonable manner and you know getting the ceramics in a an orderly fashion and getting everything up and running now i didn't realize i was going to put a forward on this when i was making when i was recording them um so there will be some redundant information Apologies for that in advance, but uh, I hope this gets you into a nice confident late game position where you can take advantage of all the, ref the refined metals and the options they give you. All right, we've cleared out the area we're going to turn into our industrial area. It's down here. And so far we're just setting up some clay and some coal to make ceramics. Now one of the important distinctions here we need to look at is when it comes to making things, there's... Uh, see this here? There's no mention of duplicate operation. For example, this rock regulator, it actually has duplicant operation in requirements. The kiln does not. I'm going to use the kiln to produce ceramics, but we don't want to waste a lot of time doing it either. 
Since it has no duplicate duplicate operation required, you can actually use an auto sweeper to fill them and empty them. No, actually they empty themselves automatically. So right now I've got this uh, storage bin and I've got coal. There's more coal coming. And these two bins are full of clay. Clay can't be used for anything but to make ceramic, so yeah, just there's, there's no problem with turning it all into ceramic. We don't care. So we'll just set that on ceramic forever and you'll watch the auto sweeper picks it up, loads it, and it starts producing ceramic. Now at the moment we're keeping this far, far away from our base because we don't want the heat to interfere, but we're just going to use this early ceramic to uh, help us... Oh, we're going to set this up here. We're going to use this early ceramic to help us with inner setups, and uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, next thing we want to set up here is these machines for producing lime. We want lime to make limestone, so we're going to have one of them producing fossils, turning fossils into lime, and we're going to have the other one turning eggshells into lime. And uh, we'll stick in some storage containers here for them as well. Now, the reason we wanted all that ceramic to start with was we want to make metal refineries. Now, you can make metal refineries out of many materials, but the one we want to make it out of is ceramic, because it gives a plus 200 degrees Celsius to overheating. So it means we can run them rather hot and not have to care too much. So I'm going to start with two. There's been some changes to these, so I'm not quite sure if I'm going to need one or two, but I'm going to go to a two for the moment. And uh, we'll use these two. We're going to refine all our metals using these two. Uh, we just cracked open this oil here, the high pressure one, and if you'll watch, the oil will just pour out and fill up the area. This is very handy. It means you can just dig down and know that this is actually going to still overflow and pop back into your storage tank. We're going to do the same here and crack open all these oil sections. There's lots and lots of oil to go around. Next up we're going to look at the oil flowing through here, we're sending it into this foundry. We want to send it into... Oh, metal refinery, sorry, I keep calling them foundries. We want to send this in here because this acts as coolant, and when the coolant is used it will spit out the coolant, and it will be very hot. And that hot coolant, we're going to send it up here, and this looks a bit complicated, but trust me it's not that bad. Uh, the oil will come up here, and assuming there's space, it will pass through here and into this storage tank, basically a buffer tank. We have a second one over here, so it'll go into this buffer tank, then pop out the bottom here, and go into this central tank. This central tank is going to feed into our oil refinery. So if, if there's space, it will keep going in like this, and going around. However, if this backs up, and there's nowhere for it to go, then it'll keep backing up here until it gets to this point. If, it, if the oil can't get in here, or the coolant that's escaping, it will take a right, and go up here, and it will trigger this sensor. This is a crude oil sensor. Uh, actually, I haven't even said it yet. Yeah, this is a crude oil sensor. And when crude oil is sensed in that pipe, it's going to send an automation signal back to this device to shut down. So, oil will keep going through here, and coolant will keep working until there's no more space for coolant. If there's no more space for the oil up here to, to go, we don't want this to keep running, otherwise it'll overheat and explode. So, this here will tell it to stop and to turn off. To do that, we just use a little bit of automation, uh, we're going to use, to use a NOT gate. Yeah, we'll just stick that there. The problem is, these things are designed to activate on a... well, to activate when they detect the, the element. So when it detects crude oil, it's going to send a turn on signal. We don't want it to send a turn on, we want it to send a turn off. So when this detects crude oil, we'll send the signal to a NOT gate, which will turn it into a turn off signal. And that will send down here. Oh. Yeah. And that will send down here. So now, when there's no room for this coolant to go anywhere, and it's going to end up backing up into the machine and causing an explosion, it will instead shut off the machine so our duplicates can't operate it anymore. Now I have another tank over here, and what we're going to do is we're going to have this one up to this in the exact same method, where the oil will go in here, and then into there, and if both of those fill up and it starts backing up into the machine, a signal will be sent to this machine telling it to shut down. Now, how does it turn back on again? Well, once the oil goes in here, it tries to get across in here into this output pipe. Now this output pipe will only clear when this first tank empties. So when this first tank over here is empty, and there's no more oil coming out, there'll be a gap here. This has a sort of a preferential flow going. It's going to accept oil from there, but it won't let any of the oil from here escape until there's a gap in the flow. And since there won't be a gap in the flow until this entire tank is empty, what'll happen is we'll ha this refinery will have to wait until this entire five ton tank is empty before it will be allowed to turn on again. This way we get a sort of a buffer. This can function until those five tons of oil have built up 
once it's built up it'll turn off and won't turn back on again until this five tons of oil is empty and the only way that's going to empty is we're going to pipe it through a refinery now um i'll show this in operation when it's uh, it's actually fully built as well so you can get a better idea for how it works okay what we're doing here is we are vacuuming out all the atmosphere in this room we don't want any atmosphere in this room so we're stuck in a couple of oxygen a uh, couple of gas pumps and we're sucking out all the uh the leftover gas. As you can see, it's down to micrograms now. There's almost nothing left. The reason we want a vacuum in this room is we want these three tanks to be stored in a complete vacuum. Uh, one of the weird quirks of the mechanics of this is if you store, say, really hot liquids in a liquid tank, it will slowly start to exchange heat with the surrounding atmosphere and with the tank itself. So if we store hot liquids in here and there's an atmosphere in the same room, the tanks will start to heat up, the room will start to heat up, everything will start to heat up. However, if we store this entire, if we vacuum out everything in here and there's no atmosphere at all, uh, the heat will stay inside the tank. You could theoretically store liquid magma in the tank and there would be no actual change to the liquid, liquid reservoir temperature. So we're going to remove all the atmosphere and this room will just basically become, yep, see, not in gas, it, this room will basically become uh, invisible to heat. And if you look at the temperature overlay, it's turned light blue, that's what happens when it's nothing but vacuum. Okay, to make these liquid locks just more convenient and set them up as quick as you can, uh, you can use this uh, liquid shutoff. So what we're doing is uh, we're piping the liquid into a liquid shutoff. That liquid shutoff is hooked up to a hydro sensor. The hydro sensor detects when the pressure is above 200 kgs, so once the oil in this tile is 200 kgs or higher, it will shut down this, uh, this device and that will cut off the flow of oil and once the flow of oil is cut off that means we have 200 kgs of oil here we can replace this tile like that and then uh, this will give us a nice liquid lock so that no, no gases can get in or out and it just uh, it helps us seal off this area we're not using them all right now but I'd rather get this out of the way with and uh, we can see how this is useful to control atmospheres later so that we can uh, more carefully control uh, the heat in the rooms Okay, I just caught the overflow system here. I tried to save it a little bit before this, but I messed it up. But as you can see here, the oil is coming up and it's a, it can't get through here anymore. These two tanks are full. So it's now going down the, the overflow path. And if we check the automation overlay, you'll see that it's currently not detecting anything. So it's sending an off signal, which we're turning into an on signal. So this refinery is still active and capable of being used. Now, once the oil, let's just start it here now, once the oil gets to this point here, the automation signal has detected the crude oil and it's sent a signal, well, an on signal that we're flipping with the NOT gate into an off signal. So now this refinery is off. And this can, if you look here, disabled by automation grid. So this will not turn back on again until this tank is empty. Only after that tank is empty will this turn back on, and the only way that'll happen is if all of this empties out, then this oil here can escape. Until that happens, no more activity and no chance of an overheat. Okay, at this point I'm, I've put down the oil refinery, and it's going to be pumping its oil into these backup tanks here. These, uh, well basically there's more, more overflow tanks, or buffer tanks I should say. The problem with the oil refinery is it requires duplicant operation, which we covered briefly earlier. Uh, but effectively what that means is this will not run unless there's a duplicant standing at the wheel running it. Otherwise it just sits there and does nothing. Kind of like a hamster wheel. So a duplicant will have to work this device. That leads to problems if you don't have uh, a buffer system. Because what will happen is your duplicant will run the device. The oil will say go along to your oil refineries and eventually it will back up. There will be the, the petroleum refinery really won't burn it quickly enough or something will happen and you just the, 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 the back up. Once, uh, once the oil will back up in the pipe and get back to here, the output will be blocked. Once the output is blocked, this machine will say, oh, you can't run me anymore, and your duplicate will stop and find some other task to do. And then about five seconds later, the blockage will clear as the oil is burnt, removed, or processed for some other purpose, at which point the duplicate will have to run back to the machine. And this causes a stutter, and it basically just results in your duplicate coming down, activating the machine, running away, coming back, running away, coming back. And it just uh, it causes a lot of interruptions. So what you want to do is put in a buffer tank. Pretty much the same as these. We're running it the exact same way. Uh, the oil will come down here. Uh, it will go into this tank. This tank will then feed into this second tank. And then that feeds out where we're going to uh, burn it off or do stuff with it. 
this other tank here is for plastic. We won't worry about that for now. All we're worried about is these two tanks. So the oil will come down here, go into the first tank, then dump into the second tank through here. And if this first tank fills up, then we'll back up into this first tank. And once the first tank fills up, all the way back to here, this overflow pipe will kick in. So if both tanks are full, and it's backed up with oil, all the, or petroleum I should say, all the way to here, the petroleum will pop down here, hit this sensor, turning off this oil refinery. And then the oil will sit here and be unable to escape until this first tank is full. Or the petroleum will sit here until this, uh, this first tank empties out, then the petroleum can escape across here. Because you see this oil here? It's going to constantly keep flowing here, assuming we're consuming. And so long as the, uh, the oil is coming out of this tank, this oil that's trapped in here will be unable to get out, meaning the oil refinery will stay off. And this gives us a buffer system to not have to worry. Now, what we're doing here as well is I've got two little mini pumps in here. I got them because I produce some plastic. These little mini pumps were vacuuming out this room as well. We're uh, taking all the gases out because we want to store these in a vacuum too because we don't want the heat leaking out into the surrounding area. The oil, the petroleum will come out of this at 70 degrees. So this will pump out all the, the oxygen that's in the room or well, whatever gases are in there until it's a vacuum as well. Once it's a vacuum, we can crack open these doors and it's still a serviceable part. We're also going to do the same here. This will be for storing natural gas. We'll close the doors. Well, we'll put in two little mini gas pumps up here, lock the doors here, pump it all out, and then we can open this door so that this whole area is serviceable and it's in a vacuum and safe. Okay, and here's a, an example of a, a common problem or a mistake, maybe. Uh, I didn't vacuum out this room first. Uh, this oil refinery produces natural gas as uh, one of its side effects it will output petroleum and then the natural gas just gets released into the surrounding environment. It doesn't actually have a, an output, a pipe output. So it's going to fill this room with natural gas uh, until a certain pressure. Once a certain pressure is reached, this device will shut down. So we're going to need to siphon off that natural gas. Now, I don't want anything else in here. Now, I should have vacuumed out this room first, but I, of course, forgot I was in a rush. So what we're going to do here is the system, you'll use it a lot. It's basically you want to leave the natural gas in, take everything else out. So we're just going to use a gas pump over here and we're going to run it through a gas filter. We're going to output all the natural gas right back into the room. And anything that's not natural gas, we are going to send out here and dump out. You know, it'll be oxygen, carbon dioxide, whatever's in there, we're going to dump it out. You can put it into a gas tank or whatever. I'm just sending it out a high pressure vent here. And by doing this, oh, zoom out a bit, that's really loud. And by doing this, we're able to actually extract all the oxygen in the room. It'll take a cycle, maybe three, but eventually all the, the oxygen in here will be gone and the only thing left will be the natural gas. Now, systems like this are very useful. There's just a, a couple of mechanics you want to keep in mind when you're doing it. Lighter gases float up and to the left. Heavier gases go down and to the right. So if just say there was hydrogen in here and I wanted to leave the hydrogen in here and take out the oxygen, well, the hydrogen is going to float on top. It's a lighter gas and it'll float up to the top left. And the oxygen will gravitate towards the bottom right. So I'd actually set my gas pump over here to extract the oxygen and I'd have my uh, my hydrogen vent out here outputting the hydrogen up in the top left. So what will happen cycles will be the natural gas is going to get any natural gas that gets over here will get dumped back in the corner and the oxygen is slowly going to get forced out over here until it's all gone and this whole room is clean. You're going to use mechanics like this to fill rooms with hydrogen. Um, actually hydrogen is the main one. Natural gas, I, I only really do it for this. You might also use it to either vacuum out or clean out say, a natural gas uh, geyser, the area around it. And for steam vents, you might actually want to make a complete vacuum so that when any steam comes out, you can instantly cool it. But we'll cover more on all of that later. This is just a handy way of controlling gas pressures in here and controlling your atmospheres for optimization purposes. Okay, right now I'm just uh, filling up this ice box. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to do a foreword on this video. There's so many mechanics that need to be covered. Uh, this ice box here is, well, it's basically a thermal aqua tuner made out of steel. Uh, that means it has a... This is very useful, but we're going to fill this up with petroli uh, petroleum. Petroleum will absorb the heat coming out of this aqua tuner and uh, we'll run some piping through here to soak up the heat and remove it. Uh, to, to fill it up, I'm just using petroleum because, well, it's quite plentiful at the moment and I kind of want to spend it because I'm using that petroleum to refine metals. So I kind of want to keep the pipes clean so that I can keep refining metals at maximum speed. Uh, so at the moment, all the petroleum is just being dumped in here. We're going to build a power plant down here and all the petroleum from here will be piped in later. But for the time being, we're just going to uh, dump it into this tank 
fill it up and we'll have a, a nice cooling block for, for our ice box. Just uh, constructing our ice box here. We haven't filled it yet, but we will shortly, and this will be uh, what provides most of our cooling, these two things combined. And now we're just uh, getting up our coal power plants here. We're going to use this early on to generate most of our power because we're going to need that uh, petroleum to fill up a few more things. But by and large, the whole power core is starting to come together. We've got a few batteries here to store some of the energy and a few of these transformers to help us split it off and start feeding these equipment so we can start weaning ourselves off these coal generators over here. Uh, once uh, this uh, natural gas here is starting to get to a high enough pressure that eventually it's going to stop this from running. So I need to get this up and running sooner rather than later and I'm going to have to hold off on injecting hydrogen atmosphere in here just, just for the time being. Oh, when filling these you might actually get this air bubble in the corner. Don't worry about it. All you do is you just deconstruct the tile on top of it. Air pressure will fill in the rest. Then you can just put the tile back. It, it, it's a minor issue, but it, it might give you a, a little cause for concern first time you see it happen. Oh yeah, right now we've filled our uh, our ice box up, and what I'm doing now is I'm actually rerouting the petroleum, so it will go through the hot part of the ice box and dump out here into our petroleum refineries, so we can burn off all that extra heat. I'm also doing the same with the gas. I'm now rooting that up. Insulated ceramic pipes all around here, and then I'm just using granite for the time being because I don't want to waste my refined metals on radiant piping just yet, but I will upgrade to radiant piping at a later date. And then uh, that goes down here and gets dumped into the two natural gas generators. Uh, a few little bits and bobs left to go, but once that's all done, we should, uh, we should be able to start booting this up and running ourselves off petroleum and natural gas and start weaning ourselves off this these silly coal arrays I've got scattered about the place. Okay, so the basics are all up and running. We've got our petroleum flowing through uh, from here, and it's uh, running into our petroleum generators. Our natural gas is flowing into our natural gas generators, and we're generating a decent amount of power. So I've enabled both of the metal refineries, and I've set them both up to use gold amalgam to uh, refine gold. Now before this, I've been only running on one of these metal refineries. The reason being I I didn't want to actually generate that much power and uh, you don't really need that much refined materials to get started. But now that we've got this up and running on our main grid, which we're building over here, we want to hook all of these up. Everything. Everything in this block here, we want to be running it all off mains power. And to do that, we need wires. And the best thing to use for wires is gold. It's usually pretty common. It makes great wires. It's got a decor bonus, that kind of stuff. So we're just going to hook up this entire area using gold wires. So for the time being, I am just going to crank out gold like crazy. Uh, we're going to hook this all up and maybe get in. Actually, I think I've got more than enough plastic for now. Uh, but we'll, we'll hook all this stuff up and then uh, we'll go about expanding after that. Now, uh, we've centralized the water. Uh, all this polluted water that's coming out of our power refine our power plant is all being sent over there and our carbon dioxide that's all being sent down into the oil biome just to pressurize it we're using high pressure vents here because this is going to pressurize pretty quickly at some point i'm probably going to want to actually start carbon skimming this or start a, a farm for slicksters actually i'm gonna let some of those other slicksters loose as well okay if you look down there at the bottom you'll see that petroleum is listed as minus 40 degrees celsius this uh, ice box has hit well, maximum potential. We're not going any f lower than that because we might potentially end up with freezing the petroleum. Minus 40 is plenty. But we'll notice here, while it's quite chilly over here, uh, by the time you get over this side of the, the power plant, it's 57, 56, 57. That's, that's not good. We want to spread this chill out. So what I want to do is flood this room with hydrogen and put in a bunch of temperature shift plates to help spread the ch chill about. We do that, and this entire room will become a giant ice box in itself. Remember this hydrogen we've been saving since, well, the moment we set up this first electrolyzer? That's what we're going to use. We're going to pipe this hydrogen down to our power plant. We're going to dump it in here, and we're going to siphon out all the oxygen. Basically the same way we did in this, uh, this room in here. We're going to set up some air pumps, we're going to suck out all the oxygen, and just dump in hydrogen until there's nothing left but hydrogen and, and some CO2. A little bit more tricky to do it that way, but we can do it. Uh, very early on in the game I mentioned there was uh, no reason to put a battery on the consumer side of a circuit. However, in this instance, this is the... but I did mention there was a few instances that I would cover later where this was actually a good idea. In this instance we have uh, our main power grid over here, 
and we're cracking off lines to go and feed different areas. For example, these big thick heavy watt wires are our main grid, then we dip them into large transformers. Now, large transformers don't limit the wire, but we're just not going to put anything more than two kilowatts over it. And then these are broken off to feed each floor. So this wire here feeds this floor, uh, this wire here feeds this floor, well not the whole floor, there's too much power draw here, and this wire here feeds this device as well, and yep, there's a few other things, but the one one we're looking at is this wire here. This one goes across and it feeds our petroleum uh, refinery, our oil refinery. Now, that oil refinery is absolutely critical. If that stops working, we stop producing petroleum, which means we stop producing power, which means we don't have enough power to run the petroleum, the oil refinery, which means we don't have enough power. And it leads into this debt spiral. It can be a problem. If you start drawing too much power from your core network, this will start to flicker, your duplicates will keep running back and forth, and it'll just spiral down into nothing. So what we've done here is we have this linked all the way back over to these power generators. I'll cover that bit down there in a minute. And all we've done is we just said it, if the battery here hits 10%, the power generators kick in. Now, because this is on the consumer side of a network, what will happen is, so long as there's power being generated in our uh, in our power plant, this battery will always be fully charged. It's on the far side of the transformer, so the, it'll keep drawing power until it's full. This will only start to discharge if there's no power coming from the core network. If there's no power coming from the core network, that's a problem. We're probably drawing too much power for something else, and uh, we could end up with a glitch here. So what happens is, if this starts to run out of power, these generators will kick in and make sure that this oil refinery stays going, so that the core of our base will keep functioning. No matter what helps, happens anywhere else, this will run. Now, if we look at the power overlay, this wire also goes all the way down to the bottom to run the oil pump, because if we don't have oil coming up, there's, there's no point having the refinery working. So basically, the oil pump and the refinery and this gas pump that actually filters out the gas out of here so that we don't have uh, we, we don't over pressurize all of these core things are backed up by these four coal generators so no matter what happens the core of the base will keep running this core of the, the industrial brick will keep running we don't care about these anything else that goes offline that's not a problem i don't even mind if a little bit of uh, oil and gas backs up that i can live with what i cannot live with is not having enough uh, petroleum going in now, uh, in all fairness, I'll probably put some backup generators in here for this later on, but for the time being, I just want all of this secure. Okay, so we've just started dumping hydrogen in here, and if you'll notice, the cooling effect of the, the, the hydrogen conducts the heat a lot better, or the cooling a lot better, so it's actually spreading out that chilling effect. We're going to stick in some temperature shift plates to help uh, help with that, and we're also going to suck out all this oxygen, and uh, that should really help chill this entire power plant down to minus, minus 5 to minus 10, depending. Okay, so I probably should have saved up a couple of more tanks of uh, hydrogen. I've already emptied all those tanks, and I'm not actually, mm, I'm not happy with the pressure in here. Well, you, this is um, this is a little bit bigger than my normal design. I've, you always change your designs every time you go back to them. So this one's a little bit bigger, and I didn't actually account for how much hydrogen I was going to need. If you want to make a power room this big, I would advise you maybe stock up five to six tanks of hydrogen early on in the game, just to make sure you can fill this when the time comes quickly and efficiently. Uh, we'll, we'll still get around to filling it all, it'll just take a little bit longer than I anticipated. Oh, quick uh, quick piece of information, all I'm doing here is I'm filtering out the hydrogen. Uh, so basically all the hydrogen gets dumped back in here into the room. Anything that's not hydrogen goes out this direction and instead gets dumped out. Those are getting dumped out. I want to have the hydrogen down to about here. Uh, down to about here and then the rest of the place filled with carbon dioxide. I'll get these two pumps involved in doing a little bit more cleaning up later. Uh, I just want all the, the hydrogen up here so I can give cooling to all these power plants because the power plants, uh, these power plants are unique. The output of their their waste, as in the polluted water and the carbon dioxide, is the same temperature as the building. So if you cool the building down to, say, minus 10, all its outputs will be minus 10. So this is a handy way of just disposing of heat before it even starts. So we want to chill this entire room down and at the same time that cooling will actually leak out into the surrounding area because if we check the temperature overlay, yeah, we're running quite hot. Uh, but once this cooling starts to spread, we can actually chill down this whole base and it will be self-sustaining. Uh, one of the reasons we want this uh, hydrogen to be quite dense is we need it to be at, at least two kilograms per square, per tile, or per square meter. Uh, the reason for that is it's off-gassing, well, we have polluted water down here, 
and polluted water will off-gas polluted oxygen unless the pressure above it is two kilograms or higher. So at the moment our carbon dioxide cloud is only is less than two kilos. So you can see these little bubbles of, and I, I don't want that mixing up in here. I want the I want it just to be carbon dioxide and hydrogen, just for cooling purposes and to keep the whole thing running nice and smoothly. Uh, I don't want this these pumps accidentally picking up some polluted oxygen and pumping it down to the the oil biome. Now we've been uh, constructing temperature shift plates, and you can see as they go up here, they're helping that heat radiate over there. They're all diamond temperature shift plates. Um, and as this goes along, and this has uh, more time to catch up, because at the moment it's the oil at now, it's at minus 30. It's lost, it, it was minus 40, it's now down to minus 30, because it's actually off-putting so much cooling into the, the reactor. Uh, eventually it will stabilize and it'll eventually get back down to minus 40 but for the time being that's going to be running that's going to be running effectively constantly uh, we're going to just keep piling in the hydrogen until the co2 and the hydrogen hit a nice balance uh, the co2 should hit a level somewhere around here and we should be able to get a pressure of more than two kilos so long as we keep piling in the hydrogen okay finally got this semi sorted uh, carbon dioxide up to two and a half kilos per square so the polluted water will no longer off gas. We have. Oh, where's oxygen over there? Oh, there's still one last piece of polluted oxygen left in here, but we're going to get rid of that hopefully. I probably should have put a fan over there. Uh, I'll get it eventually. Uh, also, we've started putting in temperature shift plates everywhere now. We've, we're just using checkerboard because it does take a lot of resources to make these, and I, uh, I like to not waste all my diamond. As you can see, the temperature is starting to spread out nicely. Uh, the yeah, the temperature here used to be 70 degrees all over, now it's actually chilling out. And in here it used to be going up to about 80, now it's gone down as well. And we've put in some uh, metal tiles over here made out of tungsten. And they're chilling down this area over here where our power is. We're going to seal it off and do other stuff with it later, but for now, that'll just keep it nice and cool. So the base is pretty much self-regulating right now. Uh, the temperature in here has, is a little bit high, I'll put in some metal tiles there, and that will also help cool down that area. And uh, yeah, we should be good to go from there. Okay, so at this stage we've got plenty of uh, refined metal, so what we're doing is we're just replacing all these uh, pipes that we just made with granite with radiant gas pipes made out of gold or gold amalgam. These give a uh, better heat transfer, and we basically just want to be able to absorb more heat out of this, uh, out of our, well, the hot box that's feeding the ice box. That way it'll transfer more heat to the natural gas and the oil before it goes and is destroyed in the actual generators themselves. Relatively quick post word on this. This de design is not perfect by any means. There's definitely room for improvement here. Uh, I've included the save game file in the description of the video just in case you want to, if there's things I've missed or didn't explain in enough detail, you can go through them yourselves and see, see how they work. Um, these metal refineries will, will not run constantly, unfortunately. The, the buffers will fill up here because because you're not going to be fi refining enough oil to actually keep up with them. They, they output an awful lot of coolant. You could recirculate the coolant until it hits a certain temperature. There's, there's methods of doing that. I just I didn't want to include it in this design. I wanted to keep it as simplistic and robust as possible. Uh, this should also be walled off. Uh, I'm going to run a power spine up here, but uh, this should really be insulated so that the cooling is not leaking out. It's just wasting electricity, to be honest. Uh, also, this thing outputs an absolute megaton of carbon dioxide. Uh, I've been currently pumping it down to the oil biome for the Slicksters, but they haven't got a hope of keeping up with that kind of output. It's just not, not feasible. I'm going to have to cut out more space or start a Slickster farm or run carbon skimmers. There's, there's things like that that need to be dealt with. Um, but one of the things, if you want to take this into the really late game, my advice is find some uh, cool steam vents or any water sources you have on the map. Uh, I haven't been tapping those. I've been trying to do this tutorial from a point of view of you don't get any lucky finds nearby and you just have to survive on standard play. But uh, uh, next step would be definitely tap any of the water sources you can find and pump them into these oil reservoirs. Uh, I've got two. There's between one and three on every map. It averages about two per map. But if you can get two of these, you're, you're in luck because you can just uh, pump a kilo of water into each of the two of these and that will output 3.33333 kilos each. So that's over six kilos of crude oil. Combined with your starting reserves, you should handily be able to get a couple of thousand cycles out of this, enough to refine all the raw materials on the map. At the same time, these things output polluted water. Uh, you get about 60% 60 60 of the water you put into these, roughly, will come back to you as polluted water at the bottom of the power plant. So you can use that polluted water to run your electrolyzer setup. Uh, that combined with a little bit of extra water, you should handily be able to support 12 duplicates. So 
you're pumping water into your crude oil, which is powering your base, giving you refined metals and refined uh, other refined goods, while simultaneously generating the water you're going to need to actually give oxygen to your duplicates. Uh, I'm just running everyone on rocks at the moment uh, and hatch eggs, but you could also, well, switch into, say, barbecue or something like that, or other sustainable food sources. It depends on how much water you find on your map. But with this design and a, a few little builds here and there, you can generally get into the ultra late game quite happily. Anyway, I hope this was helpful for you, uh, but definitely keep improving on the design. You get better every time you, you redesign something. Uh, I know I, I, I changed a few things in this one. Uh, and uh, good luck in all your future builds.